Welcome. Today we're embarking on a new six-week study and we're going to focus at, on six kind of obscure different individuals from the Bible and we're going to look at um, how their ordinary lives were transformed by our extraordinary God. And here in week one today we're going to look at the story of Jochebed. And you might be thinking, who's that? I have never heard of that person before. I know that Jochebed's not really a name that's taken off, um, is really popular in the church nursery. Most of us didn't even know that was her, yes, her name. We simply know her as Moses' mother. Have you ever had that before, where somebody knows you just by your association to somebody else, where you're actually Bill's wife or Jill's roommate or Helen's sister? I have had that before. And sometimes when that happens, we can feel like others fail to see us and to truly appreciate us for who we are. Over the course of the study, we're going to look at four women and two men who are lesser known names. They're bit players or, or extras, if you will, in the Bible narrative. But there's so much for us to learn as we examine their unique stories. So much for us to learn about God, about his character and about his ways. And what we're going to learn um, is that we're going to be reminded that no one is insignificant in his sight and that he is actually the hero of every story. And although the circumstances and the personalities will differ each and every week, what we're going to see is God is unchanging across time. And that the eternal truths that we learn about him, they will fuel our worship, our love, and our trust of him each and every day. So let's pray together before we start. Father God, we do thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you've given us these stories of these different individuals, Lord, to show us how you care for each person intimately, how you know each one and what their need is. Lord, I thank you for each woman who is um, part of this study, and I pray, Lord God, that you would just bless her today. You know what she needs to hear in order to be encouraged in her walk with you. And so, Father God, we thank you for what you want to do in us um, this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Jochebed is first mentioned in Exodus chapter 2. Exodus is the second book of the Bible right after Genesis. So if you have a Bible, why don't you flip it open and let's have a read together starting in verse 1. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman, that's Jochebed. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done of him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to the bathe at the river, while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it, and when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. Now, many of us are familiar with that part of the story. We've heard about how Moses was put in a basket and left down by the river. But if we want to understand why, we need just a short history lesson, because otherwise we could kind of think that Jochebed was a bit of a negligent mother. Exodus chapter 1, it recounts for us a little bit of the history uh, that happens in the book of Genesis. And Exodus 1 tells us that a man named Jacob and his 12 sons, one Hebrew family, about 70 in all, they came to Egypt because there was a famine where they lived. And initially they were welcomed and they settled in the land of Goshen nearby. But then over time, a new king had come to power and he viewed this ever-growing people as a threat. And so he decided to force them into slavery. He had them building the cities, he had them working in the fields, but then their numbers continued to multiply despite the suppression. And so then this king demanded that the Hebrew midwives would kill the baby boys at birth. And when that failed to achieve results, the Pharaoh commanded all people to take every son born to a Hebrew and cast him into the Nile River. And it's within this context, with this evil edict in place, that Jochebed gives birth to a son. Now in our time today, I want to pull out three truths for us, three truths for us to hold on to. And the first one is this, that God is working even when we can't see it. 
There are times in the Bible when God led his people with a cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night, times when he spoke audibly to individuals, or we can read in the New Testament, we can read about how the Lord Jesus, um, the work he did among the people, what he said, what he did, his ministry here on the earth. And we know undoubtedly in those times that God was active in those moments. But the truth is that he is always working, bringing about his good purposes and his good plans. And when we look at Exodus 1, we can see the family of Jacob has become fruitful. It's growing increasingly, increasingly strong. Verse 12 in the NIV says that the Hebrews filled the land. And although life is hard for them in Egypt, God is beginning to fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham. They are indeed becoming a great nation with many descendants. Even while they're slaves in a foreign country, God is blessing them in the midst of their hardship. It's amazing how that happens, doesn't it? It happens often. During this time, God also shows favor to the Hebrew midwives. Now, we don't have recorded for us that he spoke to them directly about it, but the scripture tells us that because they spared the baby boys, the Hebrew baby boys, God gave them families of their own. The situation for the people of God in Israel was not ideal. They would not have chosen it at all. And yet God shows his loving kindness to them, and he's working behind the scenes on their behalf. When we are in difficult times, when we're hard pressed, sometimes we can be tempted to ask, where is God in this? I don't understand what God is doing. I don't know where he is and why this is happening. And the reality is that his ways are not our ways. And often we will not see or understand what he is doing in that moment. Insight often comes with hindsight or sometimes it never comes at all. But we need to remember that he is always working and he is good. The Lord Jesus said in John 5, 17, he says, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. The God who made us, he does not slumber, he does not sleep. He never takes a day off. He will never forget about us. He is always working, even when we can't see it. The second point that I want to make is that God is working unto salvation. God desires to see people rescued from bondage and restored to right relationship with him. In Exodus 2, Moses is coming into the world and he would be the one to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery. But it's incredible, his life is in danger immediately. And in our passage, it says, when Jochebed, his mother, saw that he was exceedingly fair or that he was a fine child, no ordinary child, she decided to hide him. And I've always found this kind of interesting. Doesn't every new mother think that her baby boy is exceptionally handsome? Isn't every parent convinced their child is breathtaking? I love how Matthew Henry puts it when he says that the beauty of the Lord sat upon him. And it was obvious to Moses' parents right away that this child, even from birth, was set apart for a special purpose for God. Yes, his parents would have been motivated by human affection, of course, but there was also some sense of a divine revelation that they were to protect this child. And to perceive that, Moses' parents would have had to have an eternal perspective. It had been many, many years since the Hebrew people had had a word or a vision or a promise or a dream from God. And yet Moses' parents faithfully watched for it. They were looking for him and they saw God's favor on the face of their newborn son. Despite a seemingly hopeless situation in Egypt, Moses' parents were keeping their eyes out for God. They were waiting for him to come and to rescue his people. I've been really challenged by their example, and I've wondered, do you and I have the same eyes of faith? Are we hope-filled, watching and praying for God to do his saving work in our hurting world? In these uncertain times, it can be um, our focus our gaze can be on temporal things, and we can miss and neglect what God desires to do, what he's called us to. As Christians, we are called to be his witnesses in these days. We are to be praying for the Lord to redeem the lost and joining him in this work. But we need to be ready, and we need to be willing to be used by him as he draws people to himself. And Moses' parents' actions would have had severe consequences if they had been found out. They risked a lot, including the lives of their other two children, Aaron and Miriam. 
And the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 22, that it was by faith that they hid Moses because they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, I'm sure they were afraid on some level, but it didn't stop them. So often we miss out on being instruments of the gospel, miss participating in the salvation work that God is doing because of fear. We can be afraid of rejection from friends or family or of other potential or perceived negative outcomes that could come as a result of us sharing our faith. I'm always amazed when I hear stories, especially from believers in other parts of the world who are facing legitimate persecution. I'm always amazed at their stories of how they share the gospel out of love for God and love for God's people who don't know him yet. They continue to share courageously, even though it could mean their own imprisonment or even death. Now Moses had to be protected as an infant from this, from this law that sought to kill all the baby boys. And it's actually very reminiscent of the law that was in place when the Lord Jesus was born, the one imposed by King Herod. At Christmas time, we often sing the song, Mary, Did You Know? And I've been thinking about the words this week, and it says, Mary, did you know that the son you would deliver would soon deliver you? And I've been thinking about how those words could actually be applied to Jochebed as well. And in both these stories, the courage and the faith of these godly women, it comes shining through. For each one, the pregnancy would have been stressful, and the situation around the birth would have been scary. And yet, both Mary and Jacob had placed significant roles in mothering children who would save God's people. And there's other similarities too, actually, between Moses and between the Lord Jesus. Moses is actually what's called a type in the Bible. It's a person who points to the coming Lord Jesus. The life of Moses gives us a small and incomplete glimpse of all the Lord Jesus would accomplish. Moses would bring the people out of bondage physically, and this is a picture of the Lord Jesus and how he frees us from being slaves spiritually, slaves to sin. Moses liberated a certain people for a certain time, but the Lord Jesus would be the ultimate deliverer for the whole world and for all time. And in dying on the cross at Calvary and being raised on the third day, Jesus offers salvation to anyone who turns from their sin and puts their trust in him. The Lord Jesus sets us free from the penalty of sin that we deserve, he took God's wrath upon himself, and in doing so, he opened the way for us to have new life and relationship with him. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. We can see God working unto salvation in the days of Moses, and we can be certain that he continues doing that redeeming work even today. God desires for each person to know him personally, to walk with him closely. And there may be some listening who have never come into a personal relationship with Jesus, who have never accepted his gift of forgiveness, who have never turned from their sin. And if that's you, can I just encourage you to get in touch with us at Women? We would love to talk with you, to walk with you, to pray with you, to answer any questions you may have about what it means to know God and to have a personal relationship with him. So God is working even when we can't see him. God is working unto salvation. And God is working finally for the good of those who love him. If you read the text in Exodus 2 carefully, you see the incredible lengths that Moses' mother went in order to save and shield her son. She hid him for three months and that jeopardized her entire family. She made him a basket of strong materials and then she made it watertight all around the edges. Then she strategically placed it in the reeds near the river. Commentators think that maybe this was an area that was trafficked and she was hopeful and expectant that maybe somebody might see the baby and take pity on him. Moses' older sister Miriam was also stationed a little down the way so that she would see what happened to the baby. Jochebed would have grasped the real dangers that were involved here. In no time at all, the infant would have succumbed to exposure or starvation, or he would have fallen prey to the predators in the water. This is not like leaving Junior at the in-laws. Jochebed did everything she could according to human wisdom, and then she placed her child into God's hands when she left him by the water. And what happens next is like a scene from like a well-crafted movie, but the reality is that it actually happened. According to God's design, Pharaoh's daughter spots the basket and sends her attendant to fetch it, 
and when they open it, they see the infant crying inside. And I'd never thought about this before, but the exceptional beauty of this baby, which had been assigned to his parents of God's blessing, it was his beauty that helped actually to save him. It's unlikely that Pharaoh's daughter, that she would have adopted a common or homely looking Hebrew baby and brought him up as her own. But God ordained each detail of Moses' life, even his very physical body in perfect wisdom, knowing what his future held. There's such a tremendous irony here too as well. Who would have guessed that a child who was ordered to be killed by the king would then be raised within the palace? But God was preparing Moses for something. He had a plan and part of it was for Moses to be educated by the best teachers in all the land. I am sure that when Jochebed left her newborn by the river, she prayed that he would just somehow survive. That was the best that she could hope for. However, not only does the child live, but he's brought into the palace, into the royal family, where he will want for nothing and he will never be a slave. As a Hebrew mother living in those days, who could have asked for a better outcome? And yet God in his goodness, he does so much more for Jochebed. God is raising up a man to deliver his people from bondage. And he's going to lead them into the promised land. He is working on this grand scale, epic rescue mission. And yet the personal needs and longings of Jochebed, they are not overlooked. Miriam quickly asks Pharaoh's daughter if she should get somebody to nurse the baby. And, and Pharaoh's daughter says yes. And so she goes to get her own mother to care for this child. And the baby is then brought back into his parents' home. Now without fear, without hiding, and even with wages being paid. And now Moses will be able to nurse at his mother's breast. And Jochebed and Amram, his parents, they'll be able to care for Moses, to pray for him, to cuddle him, and to teach him. They will establish the very young Moses in the ways of the one true God and instill in him a love for his own people. God is so gracious to Jochebed, and then he gives her back the baby that she had given over to him. Yes, she will need to bring him back to Pharaoh's daughter when he's ready to be weaned, but we've already seen that Jochebed had her eyes fixed on the Lord. She had this eternal perspective. And although she will have to say goodbye to the child again, I am sure she does so with a thankful heart, thankful for God's generosity in that she got that extra time with him and not filled with bitterness and feeling like she lost out on something she was entitled to. God is working even when we can't see it. God is working unto salvation. But God is also working for the good of those who love him. And even in difficult circumstances, in hardship and pain, we can trace his loving kindness to individuals, to those who love him. And that should be such an encouragement to us no matter what we are facing. I was reading recently about a famous man who accomplished a great many things in his life. But apparently he was not an attentive husband and he wasn't a very loving father. And some have excused these failings because they said, well, he prioritized grand pursuits and he positively impacted thousands of people. So, so that's okay. And that's what really matters. We serve a God who is sovereign, who reigns above all, and he places kings on their thrones. He assigns rulers over the nations but he also returns a baby boy to his mother's arms so that she can hold him a little while longer. It's amazing how God does this, how he is orchestrating so many things all at once, small and big around the globe and even in our very living rooms. And this woman whose name many of us didn't know, her heartaches are soothed in this smaller scene, even as God prepares Moses to leave the nation of Israel on the main stage. Sometimes we might feel like God is too busy with the big things, the really important things, the stuff that he's doing. He doesn't have time for me or for my needs or my concerns. But as we're going to learn in this study, what we're going to see is that God sees each one of his children. He knows us intimately. He knows what we need and he cares for us as individuals, laving, lavishing us with his extravagant grace and mercy and goodness. And we should note that Jochebed's situation, it doesn't tie up with a bow here. Um, the Hebrews would still have to wait about 80 years for freedom. And she doesn't move into the palace. 
with Moses or anything like that. But deliverance is coming and she receives God's goodness, God's blessing in some measure while she waits for it. She's consoled. We do experience God's goodness and his kindness in this fallen world, but we do so anticipating something that is so much better. We await the time when he will make all things new, the new heavens and the new earth. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've noticed, but things are not perfect down here. Many of us love the words of Romans 8.28. They say, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. These are comforting words, but it's also helpful for us to know their context, to look at the verses that came before. And if we start in verse 18, it describes how we endure suffering because we know that there's a future glory coming. Paul says that the creation is groaning and that we are groaning too as we await the redemption of our bodies, as we anticipate heaven. And we need that eternal perspective. We need that here on the earth in order to persevere in difficult times. And we need to remember that God is working out all things for the good of those who love him. And we do see that good now. But the best is yet to come. And I hope that as we hear Jacobed's story this morning, we are encouraged to look at the world, to look on the Lord with eyes of faith, to be expectant and to know that he is working even when we cannot see it. That we would know and understand that he is working towards salvation, that he is bringing people to himself and that we would be praying for that, watching for that and wanting to join him in that. And that we would know that he is working for the good of those who love him, both now and in the life to come. Let's pray together. Father, I would do thank you for your word. And we do thank you that you are such a loving God, that you are so big and yet so personal, and you see our every need. Father God, I thank you that we can trust you today. And I thank you that you are at work in our lives, Lord. Help us to see you through eyes of faith. And um, Father God, I just pray that you bless each one here. In Jesus' name, amen.